Hello and welcome to today's Movers and Shakers virtual event. My name's Lena Tasha Salter and I'm Managing Director of Movers and Shakers. I hope you're all having a really great week so far. So Movers and Shakers is continuing with its full virtual schedule of events and I hope you're enjoying these. Uh, we've got 25 years experience now in shaping and bringing together events across the property industry, uh, high level forums and conferences uh, with senior players in the private and public sector. We're really enjoying putting together the virtual events and we will continue these once we get back to the physical events as well. If you've missed any of our previous virtual events since April, do go on our YouTube channel, do have a look, do enjoy and please do subscribe. So today's event is actually the second in a series of three webinars, which is based on the white paper planning for the future, which clearly sets out a number of radical reforms to the UK planning process. Now, these have become rather contentious. They're hotly debated. So we've created this planning series with Terence O'Rourke um, of three webinars. Last week, we had one focused on zoning. Today's is on community engagement. And next week, we're looking at the planning gain process. So today, community engagement in a digital world. So we welcome three experts to talk about this topic. We welcome Wesley Ankra, who is the founder and managing director of Searbridge and Councillor Nezel Kalistan, who is the leader of the London Borough of Enfield. Michael Edwards, who is teaching fellow at the Bartlett School of Planning and also a member of Just Space. And our guest chair today is Faraz Baber, who is a director at Terence O'Rourke, a planner himself and a most accomplished chair. Thank you to you all for joining us. Okay, so Terence O'Rourke is actually the sponsor today. So thank you again to Faraz and his team. Now I'm sure most of you know Terence O'Rourke by now. Uh, they're an interdisciplinary practice. They cover planning, master planning, architecture, landscape design, heritage and environmental services. They've got offices in London, Birmingham and Bournemouth. And they have a track record for bringing forward successful estate regeneration schemes and unlocking strategic industrial locations, creating more homes and jobs. And they're really proud of their high quality place making schemes. So a great organisation. We can put you in touch with the team. Do look at their website. Do have a look at all of their social media. So back to this morning's event, community engagement in a digital world. So we're looking at the planning white paper, planning for the future. Now, what was driving these new reforms? Well, clearly the need to have more homes built at speed, so increasing housing delivery um, by simplifying the plan making progress process, but also to increase community engagement using digital technologies. Now, there's been lots of arguments. Actually, is this possible or is it mutually exclusive? So we'll be discussing this today and we'll also be looking at the platforms for community engagement the digital platforms, you know, is this going to increase the breadth, the width of engagement with the community, or is it going to be exclusive rather than inclusive and, and a subset of the population maybe not being able to access this? So there's lots of questions to be asked. And when we look at the new zoning process, which we discussed last week, you've got areas for growth and for renewal, and the, they will get outline planning permissions for this. Um, and how will you engage with the, with, the plan, with the community at the beginning of the plan making stage? That's going to be difficult. Further along the line when um, more detailed planning applications are put in. So much to think about. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Faraz and the panel. I know there's lots of things they can inform us of and lots of debates to be had. So we have an hour session now. Please, please ask questions. I know they'll be looking at the Q&A tab. So do put your questions in and I know Faraz We'll answer them and get the panel's answer. Thank you very much indeed. So over to Faraz, over to the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Movers and Shakers. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in what I hope will be this afternoon, a really deep dive discussion on meeting the challenges that are being set out in the new planning white paper, planning for the future. Now, just before I go to the panel to ask questions, I think it's probably useful just to spend a couple of minutes explaining some of the key headlines uh, and the backdrop to where we are and why we've got to uh, the, the proposed reforms. The Prime Minister himself in the White Paper has made some very key observations in his mind why he's taking these radical reforms. He believes it's not delivering the homes and jobs that are required. He believes even that the planning system is crumbling and he says time to tear down and start again. 
So he wants a simpler, clearer, and quicker system to navigate. He wants to give a greater say to what gets built in your communities. He accepts the criticism that the reforms that re represent a huge change uh, and moves away from everything that we know about our current planning system. But he wants to reconnect communities to the planning process, make residents more engaged in their areas. And the charge sheet he puts to the planning system is that the planning decisions are discretionary rather than rule-based, which is like many countries, as we've seen in New York, for example, a very rule-based system. Uh, he equates that to creating greater planning risk, increased costs of capital for development, uh, and it, stall it stalls in innovation in his view. He also quotes in terms of local plans that they take too long. Only 50% have an up-to-date plan today. In some cases, about an average of seven years to actually produce a plan. And when you look at the detail behind those plans, whether it's housing, the assessment, viability, environmental impacts, he thinks they're just too complex. And more importantly, and more in tune of what we're talking about today, he quotes, there's a loss in public trust. MHCLG cite in a recent poll, 7% of trust in local councils to make decisions about large scale developments uh, that is good for their area. That's 7%. You go, the, the report goes on to say, the white paper says, 49% distrust in developers and 36% distrust in local councils. Now the consultation is dominated by, uh, in planning processes and consultations, he, he quotes to say is dominated by the few and willing and able, who are able to navigate the process. And the voice of those who gain from development is not heard loud enough. And quote saying, particularly young people. Uh, little, use is, little use is made of technologies like maps and interactive, interactive digital services. So why he's pushing the planning reforms that we see uh, for consultation today is to simplify local plans, where it will take 30 months to deliver one. And within that 30 month period, there will be staged areas for consultation. He wants it to have clear sets of rules rather than it being discretionary, visual and map based. Digital technology is clearly driving this, a standardized format. Uh, as I said, rules so that communities can have confidence that what will be decided in those plans will be delivered. Uh, and, and in a sense, what he wants to do is create confidence. So he wants to get trust back into the planning system and ensure that communities' voices are heard. There's a huge amount in this that underlies the direction that this government's taking and be sure that the government is transforming this process. And what we want to learn today is how do we evolve our engagement, our work around that. And with our panel today, we're going to have that deep dive discussion. And to open up that conversation, I'm going to invite Councillor Kaliskan uh, to tell us how does she see the system working at the moment in her borough? What is working well, what isn't? And then probably I would like to touch on that very heavy heart sinking point about the trust or distrust that's coming out in terms of the communities and local council. So can I perhaps invite, just to make some early opening remarks, Councillor Kalisan, you know, how are you seeing this working at the moment? And what do you think the new system will do with what you're having to contend with in terms of growth? And how are you responding to this point about distrust? Councillor Kalisan. Thank you very much, Faraz, and, and thank you very much um, uh, for having me on the panel. Um, it's an interesting time for both local government, but also for um, uh, planning policy, uh, because I think, as you say, it is just so transformative and significant, um, the proposals that are on the table. Um, the challenges that I think the reforms present are new challenges, but and actually, in some ways, um, the question needs to be as to whether they really address existing challenges, which I think speaks to the point about why is there frustration at the moment with a planning system? And why is it that so many of our communities feel like they can't engage with uh, the planning policies or processes? Um, and the disconnect between a local authority, a developer, a community, and you know, without getting into the nuts and bolts, I think the first thing collectively, whichever sector you're in, um, we have to acknowledge is that planning policy and successful planning policy and approaches needs to be about people in communities and the way that people live their lives and not about delivering buildings. 
because the moment it becomes about buildings, you immediately lose a connection, connection or a, a potential connection with a community and the necessity in order to be able to shape any future development based on what that community needs. So it needs to be more about you know, people and our needs and their needs and what our communities want and way beyond just um, buildings. And one of the reasons there is a distrust, and I think we've got to be honest about that, between communities and their planning system is because if you are feel distance with something, you don't understand it and you feel distrust. And the reality is whenever I speak to residents or local community groups or businesses, in fact, um, they won't talk about a process or a, a, or a plan or a policy, but they'll talk about their local high street, they'll talk about community, they'll talk about the fact that there needs to be social infrastructure, they'll talk about the design of a building. Even. They'll talk about it being ugly or it looking nice. Um, they'll talk about height for sure. Um, they'll talk about the place more than anything else. And if there are a few opportunities to be able to genuinely be able to do that uh, very early on in the process, as opposed to what feels like a rubber stamping exercise at the end, then I think communities feel like it's something that is disconnected to them and utterly meaningless. The challenges with the reforms, to what extent does it address what I've just spoken about? I'm not sure it does. It doesn't fundamentally deal with that. I acknowledge that it attempts to because it's about saying we're giving more voice to local um, people, but just saying that doesn't mean you achieve it. And then, of course, creating a new planning system that you know, creates uncertainty about existing local plans and democratic processes, um, and of course, putting additional burdens on local authorities without funding to support them. All of that adds to a mix of uncertainty and an element of chaos at a time that I think is particularly difficult um, for the economy in particular. Can I just sort of touch on two elements of what you said is, you know, first of all, you know, in terms of that engagement of the local plan, if actually you front load the engagement, and we'll, we'll talk to the panelists the best methods in which to do that, but if we can find a way in which to uh, widen the engagement beyond that specific building and that particular design or whatever it might be, and engage that wider front loaded element, that what is it that we need to do? And, and do, you, do you accept the need to move, and, and from, as, a, as a local politician, you accept the need to move from what essentially is a discretionary planning approval process via the applications that are made on the basis of the local plan to a more fundamental shift to what essentially is a rule-based objective. So in other words, if you comply with X, Y, and Z, you know, consent is really there. So two, two elements, you know, how nervous are you about a, a change in emphasis of a local plan? And how do you see that wider engagement from your side taking place to, to get more of your constituencies involved in that? Like, so I mean, lo local plans are really important because they set a framework and a coherency for the future development of, you know, of, of an area, of a borough. You know, my borough's got 350,000 people living here. Without a coherent local plan, it could be disjointed and there wouldn't be a kind of a holistic approach to development. We also don't want sprawling growth. You know, that's why, for instance, in our local plan, which we're currently in the process of, of developing and finalising, we talk about town centres being areas of, of development and focus. That doesn't mean that it's not, it's, not, um, it's not brave, that it's not pushing parameters, but it does mean that you can begin to build that trust with the public because you can be upfront and say, look, we're going to go way beyond the, what we normally have with the local plan because we've got to meet these unbelievably difficult housing targets we're going to ask more of you as the public to accept development with height and density perhaps in areas that you never would have before but I'm going to be upfront honest with you with a comprehensive local plan so a local plan is important the challenge of course is these are 10 20 year documents and if we are unable to be flexible and adapt and change proposals to meet the needs of communities as generations develop, then what we have is a dogmatic approach that becomes utterly meaningless for um, local communities. Wesley. 
just taking account of, and I will come to you, Michael, I promise, but um, just, let, just in response to what we've heard from Councillor Callaghan and the challenges of the direction of change in local plan making, uh, which, you know, equally there was a, a really clear point being heard that, you know, places change, plans have to change and respond to those, those, those changes. You know, trying to engage a wider audience when actually it's in, in government's mind, a select few who always put their hand up and are able to navigate it. How do you see this change actually appearing? And what are your sort of headline thoughts about concerns, worries, uh, and challenges to meet those proposals? So for me, one and also thank you for inviting me on the panel today. I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of give my view on this point. And for me, I think this is one of the best parts of the reforms is actually the kind of adoption of a digital approach to engagement. Uh, I mean, for me, I think this is an add-on, not a replacement of engaging on a site-by-site -site basis in terms of consultation. But I do believe in regards to adopting a new local plan that the community should be engaged on how and where and what that looks like. And I think currently, obviously, they're very much kind of removed from that process. I think that what we have to embrace is, is how we work and operate in, in this modern world. This would normally be an event where we'd be sat around tables on a stage in a room full of people. We've now had to move to a digital platform to engage in this way. And I, if I look around, you know, if I'm on a train, I'm on a bus, I'm on a car, I'm in a supermarket, everyone has a phone. Everyone, and I, I do like the fact they've really jumped in straight away and say, you know, we need to be engaged in this process using the technology that everyone seems to have in their hands these days. But ultimately, who drives that? Is it going to be driven by local authorities? Is it going to be driven by private developers? This is something that's really unclear in the paper, where that kind of drive to technology is going to come from, because ultimately drive equals one thing, funding. Who's going to fund it? <laughs> you know, where's the money going to come from? So I think the ideas in the paper are really good, but I don't think there's enough kind of robust thinking behind how they're going to be deliverable. And you work with lots of clients um, when you're in involved in engagement. As you know, uh, one of the things about the planning system is there are copious pages of assessments, whether it's viability, environment, community engagement, you know, you know, huge amount of uh, sort of detail as a technocrat one has to sort of plough through. Now, the proposals put forward here are to make those local plans more visual, more engaging. You know, in your view, you know, where you're competing someone who likes detail and demands detail to understand what that scrutiny looks like to what essentially is going to become a little bit more high level and strategic put simply plain English, in terms of how you engage with it, how do you see that medium working to, to make sure that the detail is, and the community engagement is fostered at the right level? Uh, so for me, I think they almost have to be two different sets of process here, because I think ultimately, as you mentioned, their language is key. And I think you do require, I mean, we, we can't sort of mitigate the need for detail around the planning application process to kind of just provide a more transparent or kind of more, as you say, plain English approach to the wider audience, but ultimately detail is required. So, I mean, as I, I hopped on a panel recently where someone basically said, you know, if you cannot put forward a decent planning application in 50 pages, you're doing something wrong. And I, I do kind of stand behind that point to a certain degree, but I think actually, which member of the public would read a 50 page document on a planning application anyway? So it's, it's still too much, but obviously, could you imagine a local authority and planning committee trying to approve a planning application with less than 50 pages? It just doesn't seem to work. So for me, you need to have a kind of a, a point where you have the engagement with the communities as one part, but ultimately how that's communicated probably in a five to 10 page document and get the key points across is, is what's quite important here. And again, you know, there's nothing really coming forward in this paper that's looking at addressing that particular key point. So we're, we're looking at two different audiences here, trying to look at the same process. And I don't think that works. Um are we being realistic? You know, will will you know my 16-year-old kid really be interested in engaging with any local plan or design code for their area, which is going to ultimately impact them? How how do we get the young people, which is one of the pillars that's been prescribed here, to actually engage? So through their platforms, and this is what I mean that technology, you know, social media, um, and again, the paper does address the the need to use social networks to, to engage young people in particular. I recently sort of hosted a, um, a youth consultation and it was brilliant in, in, the, in the way that it worked because it was a room full of young people. They came in with these great sort of, you know, preconceptions about developers and development. You know, they saw our big glossy board of 1600 affordable homes and you know, 3000 new jobs. And the questions were coming back straight away. I've never known anyone receive or get one of those affordable homes. They're not affordable. I've never seen anyone get one of these jobs, you know, 
where do they come from? How do we get them? So what we basically explained was, you know, the, the contributions that developers do make to employability programs, to the affordable housing programs, explaining to what shared ownership was. But then more importantly, what we gave these young people was the, the pathway to actually access these homes and these jobs, you know, through apprenticeship programs and actually setting the aspirational kind of journey that actually, do you know what, I might be an employed young person, but I can one day, if I get a bricklaying apprenticeship, you know, end up being on a shared ownership scheme. The, the journey isn't there for anyone right now. No one understands the process, but it's not brought into their world and their language. And even things as simply as using, you know, sponsored Facebook advertising and using all the algorithms that exist around who the target is to kind of communicate this information. Because ultimately young people are very entrepreneurial and they're very tech savvy. And if they see opportunities within the built environment for themselves to kind of access and seize upon to kind of you know, enhance their own lives, they will take them. But unfortunately, no one gives them that platform to understand this currently. It's really, really helpful, sort of pointing to something that they can actually engage with and actually using that as the fillet to, to do that. It's really helpful. Now, what I'm going to do, um, before I just go to Michael, I'm going to put warning to all of my panellists, is that part of the proposals is to get a local plan in the new style format. Uh, start and finish within a 30 month period and the government have made it very clear in that window of the 30 months there has to be points of community engagement so I want you to while we're going through the discussion have a think what are the key pillars or stages in that 30 month period that you think will be imperative to engage with the community as you formulate a new local plan in that in that sort of window that's going to be made uh, I suspect statutory in terms of the time frame. So have a think about that. But while you're doing that, Michael, Michael, you, you, you heavily engage on detail in local plan making. You've engaged in many schemes in the past from King's Cross to, to the detail of the London plan, the mayor's London plan. I'd be grateful to have a response from what you've heard so far, but from someone who actually really delves into that detail to make sure and scrutinizes that detail to make it to make plans better. Now, I'd like your sense of where you think this new direction is going and, and what you think will emerge as a result of the sort of radical shifts we're seeing. But, but first, maybe a commentary on response of what you've heard so far, Michael. Okay, thank you very much, Paz. Well, I think this white paper has some absolutely poisonous and terrible things in it. It's based on a completely mistaken understanding of the housing crisis. Uh, and as the Deputy Mayor of London said when he opened the proceedings in the examination of the London plan last summer, 80% of what gets built in London is affordable only to the richest 8% of Londoners. So, you know, we are building the wrong stuff. We're being driven to distraction by these targets, which Councillor Kaliskan referred to as massive targets, which boroughs are urged to. Uh, meet and which developers are very happy to go along with because it's plenty of work for them and very profitable. So there are huge mistakes in there, I think. But there are some some silver linings and part of the silver lining could be in some of these changes to the local plans. I think if local plans uh, really governed what subsequently happened with some rules, this would be very welcome to a lot of community groups and people in community organizations, including me and other groups, because part, a big part of the problem we've had with the planning system has been that you, with luck, there are enough people to battle away about a local plan and to achieve some good policies for local plan. But then those good policies get given away because in British planning, with all this discretionary stuff, any policy can be discarded or weakened in the interests of achieving some other policy. Policies are all traded off against each other or traded off against commercial viability. And we have no redress. So we can't say to Southwark, for example, which is one of the worst offenders, we can't say to Southwark, you said in your local plan you would achieve this percentage of social housing, but you haven't. They say, well, other considerations were important, you know, other material considerations. It would be great to have some stronger rules which got written into local plans and couldn't then be bargained away. So I mean, that to me would be a big plus for, for 
communities and local groups and would help to rebuild some trust with local government, which goodness knows is, is pretty well shot at the moment because local governments slither and slide and, and uh, do things which are not what they said they would do. The other point I wanted to make is about the uh, use of IT and uh, the internet in, in community engagement. I mean, I absolutely agree that it, it could be an immense asset. It could hugely help to disseminate views of what's happening, to foster debate and discussion, to build an informed public in any locality about the problems of areas, the statistics, the distances, the pollution, the air quality, the housing problems, the rents, all these things. That could be fantastic. But we do have to remember that there are about 2 million people in Britain with no internet connection at all. And I think about 15 million people whose only internet connection is through a pay-as-you-go card in their phone, which is not really what you need. It's not, it's not much, and it's, it's, it's expensive. And we discovered this not just in relation to planning, but during the COVID pandemic with schools and the fact that kids, uh, kids in homes without good internet connections and good broadband and without enough computers are cut off from the teaching which is offered to them when the schools are closed. So the whole society needs to deal with this digital exclusion. And I think for the planning thing, what we need to do is for a transitional period of some years, do both. We need to make fullest possible use of good IT, good visualization, but go on putting notices on lampposts, saying that there's going to be something new in this area. To go on having all the documents available in public libraries, so long as we still got some libraries, uh, because there are lots of people who can't access it online, or who are not going to bother they're busy online doing something else, communicating with their family in uh, wherever they are in the world. They're not going to go scanning their local authority website every few days to see what's proposed. So uh, I, I think what you're saying is what you're looking for is media. Both. Yeah. So you're looking for a hybrid solution. So not one size fits all in that you go digital and actually there is a medium to be playing. That, that probably helps uh, answer Simon Felton's question who, who, who had concern about digital poverty and exclusion, where yeah. I think there is the, the, the middle ground for the two to, to work uh, together. But can I put the charge back that you made uh, about the, the rules and you, you welcome the idea of the rules and them being uh, more rigid. And of course you made the charge that local authorities uh, sort of uh, water down those rules when it comes to a proposal that might hit their desk. So Councillor Kalliskin, how do you respond to that? Because actually what, what, what I think Michael was trying to really say is look, it's about rebuilding trust. And if those rules are changed, so you may have a policy requirement of X on an allocation of Y, but actually you end up delivering something slightly different because the applicant simply has, whether it's environmental issues or whether it's viability issues, whatever it might be, has to make those changes. How do you respond to uh, actually needing to be more rigid in the policy rules you set out to create that trust that he says has been eroded because uh, it just gets watered down at the point of uh, an application coming forward? So, so let me tell you how, how I think about rules. Rules exist, policies exist in order for us to be able to do things, not to stop us doing things. And um, the, what my local authority tries to achieve for my borough is to create a place that is decent and good for people to live and to work. That requires us to build homes. It requires us to make sure that there's some kind of economic vibrancy. It means that we try and reduce inequality. It means that we try and fight for additional public services. All of those things. And if any point, a rule or a policy, hinders me from being able to do that, I very boldly argue that they need to change or be flexible. They're not a means in themselves. And then the other point about rules is that they need to be in a context of reality and they need to technically add up and work. So there's no point saying, for example, we've got all these rules and policies 
oh, and by the way, you also need to be able to reach these housing targets. Because if you take the London plan, for instance, uh, and my local authority, one of the biggest challenges is that we have one of the most amount of green space and strategic industrial land. And yet these national planning proposals don't even mention the green belt. So there's got to be a connection between rules, aspiration, and there has to be a bit of a, a bit of a reality check as well, because apart from anything else, that is what breaks the trust of our residents, because they might not necessarily always trust local authorities when it comes to planning. And I know that full well, but I tell you who else who they trust even less it's private developers. So the second point I wanted to make chair is that actually, uh, if we want local authorities, if we want to build trust, if we want there to be some genuine connection between rules, policy and what's happening on the ground, then we've got to become more comfortable in elevating the role of local authorities, making sure that they're at the forefront. Um, and that means that they need to be properly funded, all of that stuff. But equally, the private sector needs to be comfortable occasionally taking a back step and allowing local authorities to, to present the, the vision to uh, communities. They also have to be in it for the long run because the reality is planning committees, and by the way, planning committees and council committees are, are, are public forums. Um, people who are not digi digitally connected can turn up. In my um, five years as a councillor and two years as leader, I think I can count on one hand the number of people that turn up to the public um, uh, committees. Um, so it, it's not like it's working at the moment. Um, but the point I was going to make is uh, planning committees are made up of elected people, politicians, and social media and online platforms have exposed and created uh, platforms by which things planning policies and proposals can be debated uh, in a way like no other no other time before and there is just no point in trying to take the short journey on this stuff you're going to have to just be in it for the long run you're going to have to engage in a much more intense way up front compared to any other time and you might and I say to developers all the time you might as well do it in the first two months because if you do it in the final two months and the politicians then don't have your back guess what, they'll just say no and you would have wasted loads of money anyway. So there's something about being really honest, I think, with, with, with the public and with developers. So let me challenge you back, if I may, Councillor Kaliskan, because I think you make uh, a very valid point about taking ownership and being able to talk to your constituents to promote, advise, drive a direction of where you want to place, make and build homes in the right way you feel uh, is required. So, you know, while it's often the, left to the planning officers and the teams there to sort of promote the local plan that they're driving forward or consult and take questions on it, actually, is it, is it, is it much more needed that leaders like yourself and your peers and your ward councillors, actually, they take a greater central role in this new plan making rule book based process to actually be advocating what you've got in there rather than leave it to the technocrats who are simply just sort of running through uh, what I'll best describe a planning process that they're being asked to deliver. So is there more front of foot requirements for leaders like yourself to be doing that? And that's just not uh, a, in a committee hall, but on digital forums, on, on a wide spectrum of different mediums. Yeah, lo lots of different ways. So you're entirely right. But what I'd say is that has always been the case. But before, whereas we could get we as a kind of collective could get away with not doing that because you know you didn't have social media you didn't have online platforms to to fill up the the void with negativity uh, now we don't have a choice ultimately the plan decisions lie with elected members so ultimately if it just gets too heated in the room they will say no previously technocrats may have driven this forward but the current climate means that things get very difficult, very hot for elected politicians in a very short space of time. Yeah. Uh, and they may begin to say no to things to avoid that. We need to do what we should have always been doing, which is properly actually engage and shape plans uh, that work for communities. And what if you get to, a, I will come back to Margaret. What if you get to a place though, Councillor Kaliskan, where you're just not going to deliver the vision you want because you, you, you get what I'll call the usual suspects rocking up and saying, no, no, no. How, 
how do you balance that? Is this, is this about that wider engagement we've been talking about? Because what, what we're seeing, of course, the stark reality, 50% of local plans are up to date, 50%. I mean, that's no way to have a sustainable programme of development. But that's why you don't leave that gap. So if I just take a very specific example, for example, um, a state renewal, you yep. know, the, perhaps one of the most controversial things that um, and tricky things to be able to deliver as a local authority. Um, if you if you just think I'm going to do these plans, come up with this amazing proposal, work with a private developer, get this ready, not really tell anyone or engage and then get to the last moment to try and push this through. If you think you can deliver that even after you've got the planning permission as a politician, you're fooled it doesn't work like that the political pressure will just be too great and you will they, in the end you will retreat and we've seen many examples of that so that's why you don't allow the silence the gap with what can often be a few voices probably not even from that community from the other side of the borough that don't want it and instead you fill it with the information with the positive vision proposals and more importantly, you allow the community to own it themselves. So it's not my voice that's championing it. It's the people on that estate championing it. Okay. Wesley, um, I'm I had a point that. here about... Go on, Michael. I had a point about, about that because I think it's very important and that it means that above all, you've got to start these engagements very early on at a very early stage. For example, on estate regeneration, but on other issues too. You've got to start them at an early stage and indeed the council where I live, which is Haringey, has been called up in the Supreme Court for not doing consultation early enough. They're supposed to do it before their strategies are crystallised and bring forward what they're interested to do and some alternatives, even alternatives that were rejected. That's a stage at which you can engage with people really genuinely. That's when really things matter. So starting very early is important. The other thing that I think is important is that you need intermediate organisations between the council as an organisation and the mass of local groups in the neighbourhood, the tenants associations, the amenity societies, the bicycle enthusiasts, the black groups, the religious groups, all that stuff. You need something in between. And one of the best examples I've had in my experience was at King's Cross, we had a thing called the Development Forum, which played that intervening role. What it effectively did was to look at all the stuff on the council's website and so on, all those PDFs of uh, God knows how many gigabytes of uh, incomprehensible stuff, lorry loads of uh, impact assessments, digest all that, turn it into two or three page summaries on our website, have a monthly meeting, discuss what was happening, haul in the occasional counsellor or the occasional developer, put them through it with questions. And through that process, because we were independent, I think we were able to generate a very well-informed population able to participate in planning processes in a very sophisticated, grown-up, democratic way. But it was because it was an independent layer between the council and all the churning mass of uh, campaign groups. So, Wesley, I've just, we've just heard um, a point here about somebody wading through all that technocratic stuff to digest mm. it into something more succinct for people to take a view on. And, and if I look at the sort of questions from David Farnsworth and, and Michael Vivona, Michael Vivona, you know, really sees uh, the opportunity that digital consultations can make uh, and sees it as a way uh, to help in driving engagement. But then conversely, David Farnsworth, who's, who's thrown in a question, you know, worries about, you know, how, how well those uh, digital forums can actually navigate the detail around some of these planning changes. I guess the question I'm asking you, Wesley, you know, we've just heard Michael talk about somebody coming in, parachuting in like an independent group that Michael suggests to sort of, you know, succinctly provide something. The mediums are challenging because we've got, a, you know, questions firing in about concerns around digital uh, technology. Others, some saying it's great, some saying it's not. How are we going to get this messaging right? Because let's be clear, 
you know, these rules are going to, once they are fixed in that 30 month period, they are fixed to develop, develop as a development program for their locality. And if these councils and those engaging in them are just the usual suspects wider than that, rather than that wider net, you know, that, that gap that Councillor Kaliskan has so eloquently talked about, you know, we're, we're in a bit of a muddle, aren't we? So what, what's, your, what's your thinking on how we get from this very strategic vision to that sort of detailed delivery point? How, how do we get there? How do we square the circle? Uh, to be quite honest, I think, incentivize it. I think actually we need to incentivize communities to be involved in this process and we currently don't and that's not <clears throat> looking at sort of existing um, policy looking at the reforms as well there's no incentive in there for anybody in regards to getting involved in the in the shaping of their communities uh, I think as I mentioned before you know young people don't really look at a building or a place and think this is for me no one incentivizes them to come into that process to shape that for themselves uh, I think ultimately, yes, I, I agree with the councillor where, you know, massing, height, density, they're always kind of brought forward as kind of the key kind of objection points by the, you know, by, by the kind of silent, by, by the kind of, you know, very vocal minority. But ultimately, amongst the sort of silent majority, it's not an issue, in my opinion, and, and kind of working on the ground. What is an issue, though, is where people see themselves benefiting from these sites. And, and so, for example, you know, a lot of my work is in social value, and I've, I've made this point already that social value has been omitted from the planning paper, uh, the reform paper. And why is it? Because actually social value is a good way to incentivize a community to get involved in this process. Yeah. If you come through <clears throat> and you engage digitally or if you engage by going to a planning consultation in, in, in person, it doesn't matter how you engage. If you know that there's something in this for you by taking an active involvement in the process, i.e. could you see a new community space come forward? Could you see more jobs for the more hard to reach people? Could you see more personal benefits of yourself through placemaking? If people genuinely believe they would come forward, they would get more involved. Otherwise, why would people give their time to something where they don't truly believe there's something in it for them? So you're, you're, I've just appointed you a special advisor to Councillor Kaliskan to promote her 30 month local plan program. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the pillars? Let's say whatever number you think they should be. What are the key pillars? as she's devising her local plan reform strategy in delivering a cohesive plan that engages those communities? What, what does she need to take away with her in, 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 in thinking about to deliver that? Um, I would generally say the first one will be youth engagement, engaging young people into that process would be the first pillar I, I would consider. I would then look at transparency, how to explain the, trans, the, the nature of the transparent process which was being brought forward. Uh, I think that's one of the key issues. I mean, one of the points made earlier was about sort of distrust in developers and distrust in, in the kind of local authority. My experience is people kind of expect to distrust developers, but they don't expect to distrust the local authority. And that's where kind of, I think that they're, everyone's kind of wrapped into the same bubble here. So we need to kind of, you know, unpack that somewhat. So I would say almost identifying where the key areas are that trust can be rebuilt. Um, I'd, I've almost said the final point is, is the outcomes. What outcomes are going to be achieved from the process? I think that's something that people, most people I speak to have no idea of. And until that messaging comes through, until we start to communicate that better, not much will change, whether we're digitally engaging or offline engaging, we need to communicate what we're doing better because ultimately within this sector, we're the experts. We know what's going on. We look at the planning portals. We look at the documentation and the policies. As I mentioned earlier, until that comes down to a more kind of, you know, layman term, layman viewpoint, it's not going to get any better. And, and just two points, if I may, Wesley, because um, you're now appointed a special advisor, not just for the community, as in the local resident community, but for the business and development community. What pinch points are they going to engage in this new reformed process? Because, you know, you talked about social value now being omitted. Of course, they want to, as part of their scheme, demonstrate that social value. And, and where in that process do they fit into this sort of 30-month uh, process, do you think? Particularly as they may well have a landowner interest. They may be landowners, they may be developers, they may be people who have options. So how do they fit into this process that, that shows meaningful engagement? Uh, I, I would say two points. The, at the very beginning, at the earliest point, to kind of scope out what kind of the needs are. And I would say at the midpoint, so maybe halfway through 15 months in, and the reason why I think any of those two points, I think you, you can't really do it more than that, purely because you're looking at this level of resource on a local authority already stretched to do more engagement. I mean, the realistic sort of point of view I have in it, that's not, not going to happen. 
So you have to kind of, for me, limit the number of engagements you're expecting a local authority to sort of, you know, undertake themselves. So I would say in the first naught to three months and then 15 to 18 month period, you should be engaging just to show that there's been a movement in what's initially kind of scoped out at the beginning. The local authority have a 12 month period to demonstrate how they've taken those views on board and responded to them. So there should be some sort of statement after 12 months on progress on how that engagement's turning out and what it looks like. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and you know, most, most private developers I work with are always sort of hold two consultations, one to kind of initially scope out what the public and what the community are looking for, and a second consultation to demonstrate they've actually responded to the concerns that have come forward from the first consultation. I don't think you need anything more than that. I think developers do have to demonstrate they have listened, and um, more often than not, in the process I'm describing, it normally comes at the back end, so at that point, design height and scene mapping has already been decided upon, but if this is shifted to the front end of the process, then people do at least feel that they've actually had an impact or the opportunities have an impact on, on the schemes that are coming forward. And Michael, as we know, three tier systems are very popular at the moment. So, you know, we've just heard Wesley's youth engagement, transparency and outcomes uh, process. Is there anything missing from those ingredients as part of the engagement over that 30 month period that you'd add in? Well, I think one key issue, which we're all going to have to be very clear about when we write our uh, submissions to the Ministry on this thing is which, precisely which documents are included in this process of the new local plans. It's the new local plan itself, plus its uh, design guide, plus subordinate documents which have the status of part of the local plan. Now in London the big issue, so many people, is what happens in London's opportunity area. Okay, there are 30 something of them now. The decision to designate one of these is made in the most undemocratic way you could possibly imagine. It's a private discussion between the mayor's office at City Hall and the local authority in the borough, usually a landowner or developer. And it, it comes to the next London plan, EIP, where there's a morning spent on opportunity areas and perhaps 10 minutes on each one. And here's a new proposal to do something big at Nine Elms of Battersea or at Meridian Water in uh, Councillor Callistan's constituency or, you know, or Earl's Court. These are colossal projects with enormous implications for the people who live within them and around them but there is no audit of conditions before the thing starts. There is no event at which they are debated with interested parties. Suddenly there they are in the plan. The borough of Kingston is the latest to be hit by this process and they are furious, the citizens in Kingston, a lot of them, with the way their council has tied this deal up with City Hall and I suppose probably some development interests uh, it's all dependent on uh, Crossrail 2 getting built, which seems very unlikely. Oh, Michael, I may... That's the sort of thing that's got to be part of this process. If I may push back, you know, opportunity areas are meant to be areas for growth and a sustainable way to help those communities uh, see, see opportunity arrive, homes, jobs, uh, growth. You know, it, it, is that just simply poor communication by respective authorities not, not explaining the, the vision of the opportunity area? Is that... Is that just back to this old point that, you know, uh, as we've heard from Wesley and others about, you know, talking to communities about what these are. These labels are one thing, but are they not a signal that the authority simply wants to, uh, you know, prosper? Well, my impression in London is that a lot of authorities, the norm is they don't really take their citizens with them or develop their opportunity area plans with their citizens. They develop them somehow in private and just jolly well hope they'll bulldoze them through. So I'm not really very optimistic okay. about this. One aspect of it, of course, is the problem of small businesses, which came up a minute ago. And I think local authorities have a very bad record on the whole of dealing with their small and medium enterprises. They do pretty well with big business. And you used to be in uh, London first and you know that Big business is quite well organized. It engages very well with public authorities. But boroughs and local, local authorities, I think, often very bad at it. They often don't know much about their local economy. They don't deal with them much. 
Uh, I mean, businesses don't vote, so I suppose they're not very important to politicians. But they employ people and they provide services and they're crucially important. So I think there's a lot to be done there, actually, in the relations between councils and, uh, okay. and the business, uh, more business. Well, well, businesses are pretty important in my borough. Most of the businesses in Enfield are small and medium sized businesses, not least, of course, mentioning the fact that for many, many communities, it was uh, small and medium sized businesses that had allowed for social mobility like nothing else. Uh, and not to mention also um, the business rates. So um, that they are inc incredibly important. But the, the point that actually perhaps as a collective voice, they might be disjointed and sometimes are not heard, I, I do take. On the point of on the point of these um, areas that I identified uh, for growth, I think we've just got to be a little bit realistic. They don't, even if they're identified, development doesn't happen overnight. And if you take, for instance, Meridian Water, which actually I think, I don't think Michael was referring to as a bad example, I'll just assume you weren't, but I, I'm very happy to talk about Meridian Water. I think it's one of the best, certainly our approach now that we've taken it back from a master developer. But actually, um, for many years, for about 10 years, there was land acquisition, which meant that you could assemble a whole area. Uh, that was necessary in order to be able to even identify the space as potential um, area of growth and development. But the more the, the more kind of basic point I wanted to make is er, most often areas are identified not because they are an, a space that is a, a blank piece of paper. In fact, there are very few spaces like that in London, but um, they are identified because they are perhaps areas of high deprivation, housing need, etc. They're the motivators, whether the area is identified in the approach to tackle those issues as the appropriate, the appropriate solution. I, I take that point, but it's 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 more about the motivation behind identifying particular areas and the areas of deprivation. That's just the reality. So there are two bits I want to just carry on, Councillor Kaliskan, on what we just heard. Obviously, um, the first is, of course, you have to work with the, uh, I'll call it confines or within the framework of the London plan in helping drive them the detail of what you want to deliver in your local area. So the question is, you know, in this new world of local plan making, is there space for that regional plan to do what it says on the tin or is it a hindrance, question mark? What role should it be playing and what is it not doing? So, you know, there's a message there about the, the mayoral role. But of course, the other thing is, you've just heard from your special advisor about the 30 month plan strategy. Is there something you, you that resonates there or are there bits mm -hmm. in your mind that, that are missing that still need to be addressed to deliver this new rule based local plan? Yeah, I thought what Wesley you said was very interesting in terms of the steps. And I, and I was thinking as we were speaking about what are the crucial points for us as a local authority. And I think and, and, it, and I think it's it, at its most basic, it falls into two areas. One is the engagement and then it goes into the consultation. And the engagement end of things at the beginning, for me, and I can only base it on my experience of my local, uh, my area, is there is a very important exercise which often needs to be led by the local authority around honesty honesty around the challenges, right? So that's the, you're living in poverty or there aren't enough houses. Um, we're only gonna deal with your life chances if you allow us to develop. There's no local economy because there's no buildings. That's the honesty bit. And that can be simple to say on a forum like this, but it's pretty uncomfortable sometimes when you hold these public meetings. So there's an honesty piece that's about self-reflection for the local authority that requires me as council leaders to say, we haven't delivered our housing targets for the last five years, by the way, residents. So something's got to change. Yeah. Then there's something around um, agreeing a set of principles. So once you've had that honesty piece and people start to say, yes, I agree with you, that what you're saying is what I recognize, then it's about an agreed set of principles without coming up with proposals yet. So do you agree that we need more development in the borough? Yes, I do. Do you think it should be on the green belt? Yes or no? Do you think it needs to be next to a train station? When you have an agreed set of principles, uh, only I think, and some sense of kind of agreement, then I think you can go on to what the proposal for a local plan might be. And so when you come to a consultation, even if it gets tricky, which inevitably it will, you can fall back and say, but these were agreed principles and tell me what the alternative is. And, and, and can I ask you then, if, if I may, um, you talked about, obviously, there's a, there's a huge amount of leadership required to deliver this new, new, new programme at a borough level. 
What do you think should happen then to those borough leaders that simply fail to stand up and do their bit? Where should that local plan making process then go in the absence of leadership to do what is absolutely required, not just for their area, but in, in your context, for the rest of London and the, and the home counties and the region? So what do you think should happen in that case? Well, well local, uh, place making and planning policy should sit locally. I mean, it's, it, it would be a disaster if that kind of local knowledge and control was completely stripped away. But as I understand it, not having a local plan in place um, for an extended period of time does actually mean that you risk central government, even with the, the current legislation, stepping in and saying, we're just going to take over. Now, for a place like Enfield, However tricky our local plan was, the risk of not having one was so great because if you take, for example, Meridian Water, we've got strategic industrial land. If suddenly the government took control of our local plan and said, do you know what, we're going to allow some housing here or here or here, we would scupper our plans for strategic infrastructure and our housing infrastructure money that we've secured of £176 million would be at risk. So as a central government, I think you need to, I think others have said it, you need to incentivize both the community and also councils to get on with it. Um, but, you know, most local, most local leaders will do that if they think the risk of not having one is just far too great. And for Enfield, we're a good example of that. I could really scrutinize a bit more and that time is against me, I'm afraid. But what I'd like is some last comment observations. We, we have a uh, consultation imminently closing this month about the local plan making process. Give me what you believe from what you've heard about the direction of planning for the future white paper. What are the positives that we can take from this? And what are the still what I'll call uh, at risk register issues that still worry you about the direction? I'll start off with Wesley. Wesley, what's your last final point on that? I've lost you, you need to unmute. Sorry, I, I definitely say we need to look at how we incentivise this process for people to get involved. I, I think that's the key to getting a wider range of, of um, perspectives into what makes a good local plan. And also, I, I, as I said, I think it's not a case of this being as an alternative to site specific consultations. I see it as an add on. And I, I think that if we kind of let one go for the other, then we're not going to kind of resolve most of the problems we have with this process anyway. Okay. Michael, final to I agree with that. I also think that uh, it's very important to have a mixed system for the next 10 years or so with new methods and old methods mixed, that we defend those little bits of space where people can go on deputations to their town hall or to their public inquiry. Um, those are important to defend. And above all, I think it's important to defend the powers of all this to stay local, as the councillor said, rather than being captured by Whitehall to dictate what everybody has in their plans and what these zoning categories mean. So there are, there's a lot for us to do when we write these responses. Councillor Kerskin, what, what, where's the positive and negatives in all this? Uh, so the, I think the positive is that there is a recognition that the planning system isn't working properly and no one's going to advocate for the level of bureaucracy that currently exists. Um, the negative, and we haven't spoken about it for me, for me by far, um, is um, the uh, issues around affordable homes um, and uh, the fact that uh, as a local uh, authority, I recognise that there needs to be a mixed pipeline of housing um, and, uh, and a, a planning system that essentially removes um, any expectation that there should be affordable housing or social housing cannot be right and will only do uh, negative and exacerbating an already difficult housing market. So I, I must ask you that final, final question then in response to that. So, of course, you can prescribe a local plan as you may feel represents the community requirements. And we talked about the rule based point about trying to regain trust. But if you don't hold the land yourself, and you have a developer who's coming in who can only achieve X, where's the middle ground to get delivery? Because ultimately, if a plan isn't viable and deliverable, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. So how do you see that middle ground being reached? Um, well, I think there is, a, there is quite a lot of land that is owned by uh, local authorities, and you have to just look at estate renewal programmes. 
um, when where land value determines whether it is viable or not. Um, often local authorities have to turn to the private sector because they do not have the funding through the HRA accounts or borrowing to be able to um, provide the, the necessary funding to develop. And so I would like to see more models like build to rent, for example. And of course, if the local if authorities were genuinely giving funding around for grant funding, but also the ability to be able to borrow over a 30, 40 year period, we might see the kind of radical change for affordable housing and social housing in this country that's necessary. And by the way, uh, that's a key part of allowing the private sector, rental sector to also flourish, be decent and affordable for everybody that isn't able to access social housing. Kaz Kazan, I, I cannot but agree with you a thousand million percent you've been really visionary and you know I hope your peers that aren't as dynamic as you are listening in and tuning in and listening to what you said because I think you've got a lot of value that you're adding back to your community and I think and I wish you well in the delivery of all of that. Can I thank all my panelists? I think you know that hour has gone super fast. There's a huge amount that we could have touched on but I think you know what we've learned is it's about engagement, engagement, engagement and then getting that delivery uh, as the rules define so that we can rebuild the trust that has clearly been lost on both sides. Can I thank you all and now hand you back to Lee. Thank you for us, superbly chaired as always. Thank you to our panel. That was absolutely fascinating. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Obviously, community engagement is absolutely essential. And we are suggesting a hybrid model. So perhaps we have these digital platforms and then we have the traditional offline methods for people to engage with developers um, and with the local um, authorities and early on engagement, which obviously is a priority with developers, like you said, rebuilding the trust better outcomes, civic pride. Um, and I think obviously we need to go back and have a, a few changes to that future for a London plan. Um, and I think there's quite a few gray areas obviously in that, but it's, it's, it's prominent that community engagement is so important. Thank you so much today to all of you with your perspectives and to Faraz again. And next Thursday, we'll be having another, well, it'll be the actual last one of our webinars on the planning series on planning game process. But we've also got tomorrow a webinar on the Southwest investment market. So do book for that on our web website. That's 12.30, so a lunchtime session. And we've got lots more events coming up in the next few weeks. So thank you very much for tuning in today. Take care from our family to yours. Thank you again.